Our next lecture today is going to be on demyelinating disease. We're going to start by talking about multiple sclerosis. Now we have to start, what's the definition of multiple sclerosis? Let's break the word into two. Multiple, that means many. Sclerosis in, med in medicine means a lot of scar tissue. So there's scar tissue forming. Well, how can we form scar tissue? Inflammation. That is the only way we form scar tissue, right? If there's trauma, anything that can trigger inflammation, infection, damage, autoimmune disease, anything can cause inflammation. But the bottom line is whenever we have inflammation, that inflammation will eventually lead to sclerosis, which is basically fibrosis of the tissue. But in this case, since we are talking about demyelinating disease, D meaning removing myelinating disease, in this case, what we are doing is removing the myelin sheet that surrounds the neurons in the central nervous system. Don't you, that's pretty bad, don't you think? Yes, I think so. So, now let's talk about the pathology of multiple sclerosis. Well, in this case, this is actually a selective demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. Selective means it picks specific parts of the central nervous system that's going to be affected. Selective demyelination of CNS. Remember the CNS is made out of the brain and the spinal cord, which is the tail. But in this case, there are multiple, multiple focal zones, which actually are zones of demyelination, which are basically plaques inside the central nervous system that are spread around the white matter. Whew, wait a minute, where did white matter come from? Let's review some basic neurology concepts. So in the brain, this is the brain and the spinal cord, remember? And we've got the peripheral nerves coming out. Now in the brain, we have gray and white matter. The outside of the brain is actually a lot of gray matter, which I'm just going to paint right here. But if we took a cross section of it, we're going to see white matter running down. White matter running down as fascicles. Well, what is this gray matter? The gray matter is actually the cell bodies of neurons. Really? That's very true. The cell bodies of neurons that have dendrites, see that? Those are dendrites. And this is a neuron with a nucleus. It's got initial substance. It's got endoplasmic reticulum a Golgi body, and then through the axon of hillock right there, and it runs down a bunch of axons. This axon, it's the path that uses kinescence to transport neurotransmitter to the bottom of the axon, and this axon is going to fire and release its neurotransmitter. It could be acetylcholine, which is usually common in the central nervous system. It could be GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. It could be dopamine, norepinephrine, anything. Whatever the axon is carrying, it's going to fire and use it to connect and talk to the next neuron. However, in order for an action potential to occur, which allows a neuron to fire, we need these axons to be de to be myelinated. Now myelin, I think of wires, right? You ever seen an electrical wire, right? The reason why we surround them and insulate them is to prevent loss of neuron, like uh, electrons. When so when it, when electricity is passing through a wire, you don't want to lose all the electrons on the way through. So the faster the electricity can pass through the wire without getting any stops in the way. This is how I think of neurons. Also, they have these axons right with this beautiful myelination called myelin sheet and this myelin sheet allows fast super fast action potentials to run through these neurons so that it can communicate as fast as possible 
However, we are talking about selective demyelination of the central nervous system. This part of the neuron is what forms the gray matter. And the white part that I was talking to you about is the axons. They can call them fascicle axons, tracts, they mean the same thing. Now those gray matter from the outside of the brain, the white matter is now the axons of the neurons. Now, usually the case, in the case of multiple sclerosis, we've got multiple different sclerosis. Well, in this case, we are demyelinating. So this is what we are doing. Let me erase it. Demyelination. So let's erase a myelin sheet, 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 right? And all of a sudden, you see that? I'm removing the sheet one by one, and all of a sudden, I've demyelinated the neuron. What do you think is going to happen to this neuron when you remove the insulation that surrounds it? Well, it's not going to be able to fire as it used to. So therefore, demyelination of multiple sclerosis is strictly, strictly restricted to the white matter, which is the axons of the neurons. And this affects both the brain and the spinal cord. Because these axons run through the brain and also the spinal cord, then which makes up our what? central nervous system and also the peripheral nervous system is affected now the common tracks there are common tracks that are actually affected when patients have multiple sclerosis we're going to talk about some of them now some of the tracks that are affected are the pyramidal and the cerebellar pathways Pyramidal and cerebellar pathways. Another pathway that's affected are the medial longitudinal fasciculars pathway. And last but not the least is the optic nerve and the post posterior co column. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the medial longitudinal fasciculus pathway known as MLF pathway. And I'm going to talk about also the optic nerve and the posterior columns because when I talk about why the patients present with these symptoms, you will be able to understand this better. Well, on the right side of the board, I have drawn out the medial longitudinal pathway. Well, this pathway actually doesn't just exist by itself. It's actually a very, very important pathway for us to be able to conduct conjugate gaze. What is conjugate gaze? Now I want you to focus on my eyeball. If I tell you to look over there to the right without moving your head, what do you do? Did you see that? I'm able to abduct my right eye and AD, also abduct, adduct, like adduct my left eye. You see that? Now let's try to do that with the left eyeball by looking to this side. Well, if I want to look to this side without moving my head, I have to do that. Now do you see what I did? My left eye is abducting, and my right eye is adducting, and now I see you. There we go. How does our body do that? That is a very, very complicated pathway, as simple as it looks. It actually requires using the parietal and the frontal field uh, in the cortex. We need the medulla, the pons the midbrain just to be able to do that. So we're going to go over it step by step. Now in order for us to be able to co conduct a right horizontal conjugate gaze, remember this is horizontal, this is vertical. Remember there are different high muscles in the, uh, that control motor movement in the eyes. We have 
lateral rectus muscle, right, on the lateral side of the face. We have medial rectus muscle on the medial aspect, right? We have inferior rectus muscle. We have superior rectus muscle. We have superior oblique and inferior oblique. In this lecture, we're only going to focus on the lateral rectus and the medial rectus. And that is a very, very important concept. Because how does my eye able to conjugately look at that side of the of the uh, of, 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 of on the right side without moving my head. See, I can move my head like that. That is my head movement. But my eye movement is called a conjugate gait. And both eyes actually are moving in the same direction. Now, the neurons in the brainstem, which is your pons, midbrain, and medulla, and the cortex, cerebral cortex, are, very, are responsible for doing this. Now, horizontal eye movements are often gener generated by neurons that are found in the paramedian pontine reticular formation. Ooh, that's a big word. The paramedian pontine reticular formation, PPRF. 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 Or it also called the, it's also called the horizontal gaze. Now, I want us to follow this pathway very, very closely because the paramedian reticular formation, which is PPRF, is actually going to be connected to the neurons in the absent, absence nu neurons. So, now let's follow this. See, we are now inside the pons. This is the pons. Now, let's say I want to have a conjugate gaze to the right. I just want to be able to look to the right. I have to activate the left frontal field because the left frontal field has to cross over into the opposite side of my brain of my brainstem, which is the pons, to be allow my right side of my eyeballs to actually be able to conduct conjugate horizontal gaze. So when you activate the neurons inside the left frontal field, they're going to cause me to have a right horizontal conjugate gaze. So when these neurons fire, see how one is coming from the left frontal field or the saccade and the parietal cortex, they're going to activate the, para, the right paramedian pontine reticular formation and that actually synapses with the abducens nucleus. Now what comes out of the abducens nucleus? It's the right abducens nerve. Now, what is the function of the abducens? A, B, D. Look at the word. Abducens. Let's break the word into two. Sounds like the, it's going to A, B, duct. A, B, duction. And what is, what, when my eye A, B, ducts, what does it do? It goes to this side. It goes to the lateral side. When I, when I adduct, I add to the middle. So if I say Adduction, I'm adding to the middle. If I'm abduction, I'm subtracting from the middle or I'm moving to the lateral side. So follow this pathway now. The PPRF is going to activate the neurons inside the abducens nucleus, which is now going to stimulate this abducens nerve, which is the right abducens nerve. And what do you think is going to activate with muscle is going to be abducted? Well, think about it. If my eyes has to move to this side, there's got to be a muscle that's pulling it this direction. It's on the lateral side, so that is called the lateral rectus muscle. Lateral rectus muscle inside the eyeball. And that is that muscle right there because its job is to pull just my right globe, my right eyes, towards the right. So now, I'm, if I close my eyes, see, I'm looking to the right, my, I'm activating my right lateral rectus, but that's being caused by activation of PPRF. Following that? Excellent. Now, the PPRF, which is, we're still right in this area, that's the entire PPRF, also give rise to axons that course in the medial longitudinal fasciculus MLF, which often cross the midline, which often cross the midline. Now, let's take a look. This is the midline of the midbrain. The PPRF is now going to activate the MLF, which is the medial longitudinal fasciculus pathway, and which is going to cross over, see how it crosses over to the midbrain, 
And what does it synapse with? Well, it's going to go and synapse with the oculomotor nucleus. Ah, wait a minute. The oculomotor nerve? Well, this is the oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve, which is going to be the left oculomotor nerve. Because now we're talking about the left side of this. Remember, we already crossed over to the left. The left oculomotor nerve is going to activate this muscle. Hmm. This is our nose. This is the right side. This is the left side. This is the medial aspect of the eye. So what muscle do you think that's going to be? Well, that should be the medial rectus muscle. Which is innervated by the left, so that would be the left medial rectus muscles, which is innervated by the left oculomotor nerve. Now, what does the medial rectus muscle do? Well, it pulls my eye in towards the middle because it's medial. So, what is the function? It adducts the eye, adducts, adducts the eye to the middle. Therefore, using the medial longitudinal fasciculus, I'm now going to be able to what? A-deduct. A-deduct. So, it's, as you can now see, the patient will be able to have a right abduction by using the lateral rectus muscle. And they're also going to be able to adduct the eye. As you can see, when I move my eye without looking, without moving my head, right? My eyes like that, and that's like that. That is what you're seeing exactly on the board. I'm demonstrating that so that you can see that the MLF, which is the medial longitudinal fasciculus, is going to the midbrain, activating the left oculomotor nerve to activate the me left medial rectus nerve, which is activating to the left, I'm sorry, the left medial rectus muscle for us to be able to adduct our eyeball. And that is how we perform horizontal gaze. Therefore, when we stimulate the PPRF, what is the overall summary? We get ipsilateral, same side, horizontal conjugate gaze. By stimulating the PPRF on the right, what do we do? It results in abduction of the right eye and adduction of the left eyes. Well, you probably wonder, why did I spend all that time just to explain this pathway known as the conjugate eye movement pathway? It's because it's very, very crucial in our lecture in multiple sclerosis. I like to be very detailed. Now, what will happen when a patient develops multiple sclerosis? They are going to develop demyelination, demyelination of the medial longitudinal fasciculus pathway. <gasps> oh no! Isn't that MLF? Yes! But there's two of them. It's not just one, there's actually two of them because I'm just using this to show right horizontal gaze. On the left side, there's another one that crosses over that will also come down and innervate the medial, the medial rectus muscle on the right eye, and there will be another left PPRF that will eventually come down. Let me use that as green, something like this, and innervate the lateral, left lateral rectus muscle. So I'm only using. One as an example, but the reason is because when somebody has multiple sclerosis, this is what will happen, this is what's about to happen. Let's use blue. They're going to get demyelination of this medial longitudinal fasciculus right there. See that? Both of them is going to be bilateral. Bilateral. Because both of them are going to be damaged. What will happen when this patient is with demyelinating? multiple sclerosis disease develop lesions in the MLF pathway. They're going to develop a syndrome called internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Plegia means weakness, eye weakness, eye weakness, internuclear, inside the nucleus. Now, let's take a look and explain this. 
what does internuclear ophthalmoplegia mean? It simply means when I damage both MLF, the patients now will have a problem with what? Adducting. Because remember, look, let's look at MLF again. MLF goes all the way to the medial rectus muscles. So when I tell the patient to look to the right, right, do this, they will be able to abduct. Why? Because the PPRF goes straight down through the right abducens nerve and tells the lateral rectus muscles to fire, contract, and move to the right. That's good. But their left eyeball will not be able to adduct. Why? Because the MLF is damaged, so it's going to stay in the middle. So this patient will be unable to adduct this eyeball when I tell them to look to the right. Now let's talk about the left. If I tell the patient to look to the left, the lateral abducens nerve, this one in green, will be able to be activated from the PPRF in the pons. However, the medial, which will be this medial uh, rectus muscle, will not be able to adduct. So this patient will have an inability to adduct that either eye whenever you tell them to be able to, to have a conjugate gaze. However, this patient's convergence is going to be intact. So when I mean, what do I mean by convergence? When you want to do H in space test, you tell the patient to look up, down, and go across, up, down. But when you put your eyes in the middle, they will be able to converge both eyeballs in because convergence has nothing to do with either medial, lateral, a medial rectus muscle. Also, these patients, aside from being unable to abduct normally, they might have some monoocular nystagmus when they're abducting the eye. What does that mean? Monoocular ny nystagmus. Nystagmus is when you tell the patient, I want you to follow my pen and go to the right. When I tell somebody to look to the right, their eyeball shouldn't be coming back like this. No, it shouldn't be doing that. If you see their eyeball going this way and coming back and try to move it back to the center, that's called nystagmus. So when the patient has multiple sclerosis, they have one single eye will try to go back to the other eye to try to correct it. Remember, this eye is not going to move when I tell them to go to the right because it's going to try to correct it and come back to the middle. Just one warning. If a patient does have just one unilater unilateral lesion in just one of the MLF, it's an infarction. It is not uh, multiple sclerosis. It's basically an infarction. It could be ischemia in the brain. It has to be a bilateral. Now that explains what MLF means when the patient has multiple sclerosis. Now if they have it, they can have a damage also to the optic nerve, right? Remember the optic nerve is the nerve that goes and supplies the eyeball. So we've got the optic nerve, which supplies the eyes, and it's what, tra what does optic nerve do? Well, it's what carries all the information that's been translated in the retina all the way back to the occiput. So they can have damage to that, and also last but not the least, the posterior columns. We haven't talked about posterior columns, but we're going to talk about that in a whole different lecture in the posterior uh, column pathway. But the posterior columns are basically the pathway that run in the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. Posterior aspect of the spinal cord, which involves your touch, vibration, sense. Uh, inside the spinal cord and when they have lesion in this pathway they will have sensory loss. Now the incidence of multiple sclerosis is very low in people that live below the equator. So people that live in Africa and all sub-Saharan -sub Africa they do not develop multiple sclerosis. So if I drop the world this is the globe right and this is the United States and Canada on top right and we have Brazil, and when we have Africa, basically every, people that live above the equator are more susceptible to developing multiple sclerosis compared to the people that actually live below, and their incidence just is very high in people that live in this part of the world. And also, often women, by far, are two to three times more likely than men to develop this disease.
So it's most likely found in women. So let's talk about the incidence of the disease above equator, higher latitudes, and women by far, two times, two to three times more likely to develop MS than men. What causes MS? What's causing the demyelination? Wouldn't that be nice if I knew the answer? I don't know. The cause is unknown. Nobody knows why this demyelinating disease is destroying the neuron axon uh, myelin sheet. However, they think it's probably a balance between environmental factors, some immunologic factors, or even genetics. But we don't know what actually causes the disease. So let's talk about clinical features of what the patients often present with when they have multiple sclerosis. Patients with MS often start off having transient sensory deficit. Transient sensory deficit. Remember, the reason why they're developing sensory loss, which is very short amount of time, tra that's what transient means, very short amount of time sensory loss, is because their posterior column, which are the neurons that actually go through the back of the spinal cord and the posterior aspect of that run all the way and cross and go to the thalamus, are actually being demyelinated. That's why they develop this. This is how when I start, they might feel like, oh, I feel a little patch here. I, don't, I, can't just, I couldn't feel just this part of my arm or this part of my arm or this part of my trunk just feels numb. I don't know. Then it goes away. That's usually how it initially starts. And then they have a lot of fatigue. A lot of fatigue. That's the most common complaint. Doc, I'm always tired. Then they develop motor symptoms, such as weakness, weak arms. And then, you know, Doc, my arms are just always feeling weak, or my leg is always giving out on me. It's very, very weak. My, and those are motor symptoms. Or sometimes they develop spasticity, spasticity, or weakness. Well, spasticity is an upper motor neuron disease. And whenever you have upper motor, upper motor neuron disease, you always often have spastic, very, very stiff muscles. And this usually that means an upper motor neuron disease. And often it's the pyramidal tract. The pyramidal tract is what causes them to often have this kind of acute onset. Also, they might say they have a lot of leg stiffness, like I couldn't just move my legs. And this is prevents the patients from walking or even maintaining their balance because their leg is very, very stiff. And eventually this can lead to weakness and also progression to hemiparesis or paraparesis or even quadriparesis because this can, it's a very, very severe diseases. These patients also have optic neuritis, which causes them to develop visual disturbances. Let's talk about that. Visual problems. This is from lesion of the optic nerve, demyelination of the optic nerve. And often this patient's complain of monoocular vision loss. And this can happen up to about 20% of the time of patients. They just say, doc, I couldn't see my right eye. I didn't know what happened. And also they can have pain when they're moving their eyes around. Another thing that you can, patients can complain is something known as central scotoma. What is central scotoma? Patients report they have dark spots, dark spots in the center of their vision and it's, it's just that I just I just see this dark spot right in the dead center and it's not going away and then when you take the flashlight and uh, the pen light and to check for the pupillary reflex they might have decreased pupillary reaction to light and we already talked about ophthalmoplegia, which is another signs and symptoms, which, which is actually what strongly suggests the diagnosis. If a patient have intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, you can guarantee yourself that this patient has multiple sclerosis. Also, they can complain of diplopia, which is double vision, right? They have already damaged their optic nerve. They might not be able to see very well. If the cerebellum is affected, Cerebellum is the 
part of the brain that's responsible for balance, right? That's how I'm able to not fall when I'm standing. Well, unfortunately for these patients, if they have lesions to the cerebellum, what are they going to have? Ataxia. They're not going to be able to have good balance, and also they can develop intention tremor, right? Intention tremor, and which means they try to grab onto something and all of a sudden their hands is shaking that is intention tremor so you tell them finger to nose and if they try to put their finger they have an intention they have an intention to do something but they can't because because they have a lot of tremor that is intention tremor and this patient can also have dysarthria dysarthria because they can develop upper motor neuron disease, because upper motor disease affecting their brain and the spinal cord, this can cause them to lose their bowel and bladder. Loss of bowel and bladder. Let's erase this so we can get some extra space for these clinical features. Loss of bowel for number five here. bowel and bladder which means they can't hold their bowels they poop on themselves or they can also urinate on themselves because this if you ever damage the motor uh, the, the con control center in the brain for the bowel and the bladder oh, these patients also have autonomic disturbances which can lead to impotence constipation and last but not the least they can develop neuropathic pain and this is very very frustrating but it's very very common complaint because they develop they can develop trigeminal neuralgia trigeminal neuralgia neuralgia or even develop hyperesthesia hyper Aesthesia. They're extremely very sensitive to pain, to touch, and they have the trigeminal neuralgia. When somebody has trigeminal neuralgia, light touch their face, or even a wind blows on their face, it causes excruciating burning pain. That is trigeminal neuralgia, and this is called this is neuropathic pain because it's a nerve pain. Neuropathic pain. And on top of this all, this patient can have cerebral in involvement inside the cerebrum and this can cause the patient to have a lot of emotional problems, memory loss, they start to forget a lot of things, they can have personality changes, their mood changes, they develop a lot of anxiety and depression because think about it, you start with some part of your body is being funny and feeling numb. And then it progresses to motor problems, you know, they just wake up one morning and their leg is stiff, they can't walk. And also another day, they realize, oh my goodness, I can't see because I have visual problems. I'm trying to look to the right. My eyes are hacked and funny. And they, can, they start to notice they have a loss of bowel and bladder. This is a very, very debilitating disease, especially when they have a lot of exacerbation of the disease and can cause them to also have memory problems. They are forgetting things. Where's my car keys? See how this can roll the ball and affect the patient's just basic life. You know, imagine trying to go to work in the morning and you're like, you're stiff. You can't drive your car. That is very frustrating and you get a lot of very nervous. I got to call my boss. I can't come in because the disease is affecting their lifestyle. And then they get depressed because, you know, one day they realize, oh my goodness, you know, I have blur vein and I have severe pain and this pain is causing me, you know, problems and I can't go out. All right. So how does this disease progress in terms of its course? Well, most patients that have this disease initially starts in their 20s and 30s. That's usually when it begins. Around 20 years old to 30 years old. And often they have those local deficits that I talked about, which is the optic neuritis, the one-sided weakness, numbness of their body. But following that, there are different variants of multiple sclerosis. Often the, the different variants are, it could be clinically silent. We're just talking about the course of the disease. Clinically silent. What do we mean by clinically silent? Well, patients, this is often known as the benign or stable multiple sclerosis. 
often there might be some progression of this disease later on in life. And then we have the relapsing and remitting course. What does this mean when we say relapse and remit? remit? Off and on. That's the funny English word. On, off, on, off. So when patients start to have a lot of symptoms whereby they have an exacerbation of the disease, right? They have this, they might say, you know what, during the winter, I get a lot of weakness, a lot of numbness, a lot, you know, a lot of blurred vision, and it's lasting for weeks. And then as the weather starts to change, I feel better. You're like, ah, so it was relapsing, it came on. And during the summer, I feel great. Oh man, my mood is good. I'm not icky today. I'm not pissed off because I don't have any weakness. I don't have any blurry vision. I don't have any double vision. I don't have any pain. That means the disease is now remitting. That is what remitting means. So it's exacerbation, remission. By far, this is the most common type of the disease. Most common form of multiple sclerosis. That is usually how most patients often present like. This, the other form is the progressively worsening or the primary progressive multiple sclerosis or secondary, I'm sorry, secondary progressive. Secondary progressive. That's another course of multiple sclerosis. And which one is this? Well, this is often with patients with relapsing and remitting disease, but it can experience gradual worsening of the symptoms. And this is often progressive as the years calm down the line. That's called secondary progressive. But the last one is known as the primary progressive. And this is often a steady progressive disease. We got primary progressive so primary progressives will build like this. They're slowly building up, slowly building up over the years, 20, 10 years, five years. This is primary progressive. They just slowly, slowly, the disease is getting worse and worse. And often, actually disease actually appears later after 40 years old and tend to have less visual and more axonal involvement. Compared to the secondary progressive, whereby they have this relapsing, remitting, relapse, remit, relapse, remit, and that secondary progressive disease that eventually now start to get worse over the years, and then they don't remit anymore. You see that? They go up, down, up, down, and then the progressively gets worse, and relapsing, remitting is they go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And the first one is silent or benign. Now, attacks often average about one a year. So these patients can get at least one attack a year and there's really nothing that's been proven to cause these attacks. Nobody knows. They might say it's the weather, it might be this, it might be heat, it might be cold. Nobody really knows what really pr uh, um, brings us these attacks. Now, what is the prognosis of this disease? It's highly, highly variable. Some people have, most people have a normal lifespan in most patients. Although the quality of life might be diminished, right, because of the of all the symptoms, but many patients never really develop a debilitating disease to the point that they are just there, they can't move anymore. However, about one third of the patients will eventually go into disability. They go into permanent weakness or paraplegia, they can't move any of their arms or their legs. And that's usually one third of the patients that develop this. Now, often, Patients have an increased risk of developing severe disability with, if they have a lot of frequent attacks early up in the disease course and also onset that start at an older age and progressive course and early cerebellar or pyramidal symptoms, which means if the patient has a lot of frequent attacks at the beginning, that is not a good prognosis and also causes them to develop severe, severe disability and those are the one third we talk about. Or let's say somebody develops later in their 60s or their 50s, that is also can cause them to be more disabled. And if they have cerebellar, which have affect the cerebellum, and they have a problem with ataxia and also vision problems. So how do we really make the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis? Well, the diagnosis is actually a clinical diagnosis. 
which means there's really no specific labs to really give us the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So in the patients, in the young patients in their 20s or 30s, that you seem that having this relapsing and remaining symptoms, they're coming in complaint of all these neurologic signs and symptoms. It's often very difficult because they have this patch here, this numbness on my belly. You can it doesn't really fit. It doesn't really feel like they're not having a stroke or anything like that. So often that's why it's always a clinical diagnosis, and it's often difficult because these patients are having a lot of white matter involvement. However, on suspicion, if you think a patient has multiple sclerosis, you're going to order an MRI. Clinical diagnosis. If you suspect it, right, they have all these neurologic symptoms you can't really explain, then you order a magnetic resonance imaging. This is very important. Or you can also do an LP, which is a lumbar puncture, to see what the CSF is. MRI by far is the best and the most sensitive test of choice to make the diagnosis on any patients that have multiple sclerosis. And often what you're going to be able to see on MRI is a lot of demyelination of the CNS. That's why we order an MRI. So often, 90% of patients that have MS are going to have abnormal, abnormality in the, uh, on their MRI. And their CSF, which we're going to get from, which is a cerebrospinal fluid, is going to show, is going to be also abnormal in patients that have multiple sclerosis. Now, when you do LP and you do a CSF analysis, of often, although there's really no lab-specific test we are looking for, in this case, what you're going to see are oligoclonal bands of immunoglobulin G. Oligoclonal bands of IgG. And that's what you're looking for inside the CSF. And in 90% of the time, 90% of MS patients, you're going to see oligoclonal bands of uh, immunoglobulins and on MRI, you'll be able to see demyelination. Also, if you see evoked potentials, can also suggest demyelination in certain areas when they do speed of nerve conduction within the brain. So basically what they do, they're testing how fast the nerve axons of the neurons inside the brains are firing. If they see evoked potentials, evoked potentials, that is basically telling you that you have some newly uh, demyelinated area inside the uh, remyelinated nerves inside the inside the brain. All right. So how do we treat these patients? Right. Aside from checking for evoked potential, looking for demyelination uh, using MRI and also using oligoclonal bands. Well, the treatment often depends if when they have an attack. If these patients have a, an acute attack. Acute exacerbation, like I say, a relapsing or a, a relapsing episode. You want to start them off steroids. You want to give them high dose intravenous cortical steroids. That's what you're going to give the patient that has uh, an acute attack. Also, patients can also be given disease modifying therapy. This is modifying therapy, and this is actually we can use interferon. Interferon. What kind of interferon do we often use? We use the beta one A interferon and the recombinant beta one B. One A and beta one B. Those are the two interferon agents we use, and you can also use glutyrimus acetate. Glatyrimer acetate, which is the drug of choice to help reduce uh, in the relapse rate of patients that have multiple sclerosis. However, when we give interferons, I have to let you know that interferons 
actually can give you flu-like symptoms. It's basically like giving you a drug that's gonna make give you a flu. So these these drugs are not benign at all. Although they are good in reducing relapse in the patients, they have a lot of flu-like symptoms. They have you know they have weakness in their arm. They feel really really horrible when they take these medications. But this is often the drug that's necessary to help this patient. Often interferon therapy should be started early in the course of the disease and this is because so because you want to prevent these patients from going to permanent disability. Other drugs we can give are baclofen and baclofen is actually given for muscle spasms And also you can give carbamazepine or gabapentin or neurontin if they have neuropathic pain. The drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia is carbamazepine. But anytime a patient comes to the hospital and they have neuropathic pain, which is nerve pain, the best drug to give is also gabapentin. Gabapentin, and this will help relieve their symptoms, especially if they're having a lot of symptoms. Remember, there is no cure for multiple sclerosis. There's only two primary goals you're gonna do, want to do for this patient. Number one, you want to prevent a relapse. You don't want the disease to keep coming back. And number two, if they have an acute exacerbation of the disease, you want to relieve that exacerbation. Often, relapse of multiple sclerosis produce symptoms for longer than about 24 hours, and they average about one a year. But usually over time, they start to decrease, especially if you try to get them on treatment as soon as possible. Well, that brings us to the end of multiple sclerosis. I hope you're able to understand the disease in its entirety. Remember, this is a demyelinating disease of the white matter inside the brain. It can affect different tracts, pyramidal, cerebellar, MLFs, right? Also, we can affect the optic nerve at the back of the eye and the posterior columns. Patients often come in complaining of these non-specific patterns of neuro neurologic symptoms, patches of sensory loss, some random weakness or spasticity in their hands, visual problems. You just wonder like, okay, there's no, I can't really put a tract on where the disease is. You know, this doesn't make any sense. You know, it's not like somebody had a stroke and they have complete weakness in their arm or spasticity or anything like that. And then you said, oh, okay, you know, your visual problems. Oh, well, I got this black spot in the center. That's a central scotoma. Well, you can't really pinpoint if they have an atherosclerotic disease because they're usually 20s or 30s. So you don't expect them to have maybe an emboli and anything like that that's blocking an artery in their brain. So this makes no sense. That's when you go ahead and order an MRI. And the MRI will be able to highlight the areas of the brain that have the cortical demyelination parts. And then you want to do an LP to check for the oligoclonal bands of the immunoglobulin G, which is often found inside the cerebrospinal fluid. You can check for evoked potential to look for demyelination disease, causing decreased firing of the action conduction system within the brain. And then if they have an acute exacerbation, which is usually happens in patients that have relapsing and remitting, you want to start them on steroids right away. The drug of choice to treat all the symptoms are the interferon beta 1 and the way I remember it is it's better to treat MS so it's beta 1A and beta 1B and glatirumer acetate, baclofen for muscle spasm, carbamazepine and gabapentin for neuropathic pain. Thank you very much for watching this is Dr. Adishina from ftplectures.com till I see you again have a great day bye bye. Hey, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you learned a lot. Are you studying for the USMLE Step 1 or Step 2? Are you studying for the NCLEX or you're currently in nursing school as a nursing student? Are you a PA student currently in school or studying for your PANS exam? Or are you a nurse practitioner student or trying to take your MP board exam? Listen, I've got super awesome content for you. If you truly love this video and it simplified your learning process, 
I want you to check out my website below. I've listed all the list of exam, whether you're studying for any of this board exam, and all I want you to do is click on the link right now below so that you can take you directly to my website. For USMLE, just go to smashusmle.com. For NCLEX, go to crushnclex.com. And if you're studying for the PANS exam, the nurse pr practitioner exam, or you're studying for your internal medicine board exam, just click below and take you directly to ftplectures.com. Listen, I can't wait to help you. If you need to get in touch with me, just get to my website, you'll be able to reach me directly and we can work together one-on-one. -on -one. Listen, you are super awesome and my goal here is to help your dream come true. If you wanna be a doctor, wanna be a nurse practitioner, a registered nurse or physician assistant, I'm here to help you get to that next level. With your medical knowledge, let's save the world together. I love you guys. You guys are super awesome. And do not forget to click on the link below to be able to get to my website. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. You guys have a great day. Let's go.